it's a peculiar thing, Global News, because it's commercially funded as well. So we are part of BBC News. We sit within the BBC News um, structure, but all of our income is commercial income. Um, and the reason for saying that is because that affects my job as well. So my job is to decide the editorial strategy of the TV and digital services. Um, so I make decisions about what kind of programmes we do on TV and um, the, the sort of tone and style of the television channel. And I make decisions about the mix of content we have um, online. And I mean, for example, we're pushing very hard into video at the moment on, the, on, the, um, on our sites. Uh, and so I make decisions about those sorts of areas, but I'm also involved in where the money comes from. So I work very closely with um, my, my equivalent is the is the chief executive who runs the business. So he and I work very closely together um, overseeing that part of the activity. And I work with marketing and I work with sales teams and I work with communications people and I, you know all sorts of um, interesting people, as well as obviously paying very close attention to what's going on in the news and in the newsroom. First of all, now, and I have done this for more than 10 years now, I concentrate on international news for overseas audiences. And the, and the offer we make to overseas audiences um, is of global news. So we're not about presenting British news to people around the rest of the world. It's international news for international audiences. And so that's my kind of specialist area now. Um, but I think the second main difference is that now it's much more of a kind of strategic um, managerial kind of oversight role um, compared to, if you think about breakfast, that was much more of a kind of hands-on, day-to-day editing the programme and managing the programme team. And so, and, and I guess you move gradually from one thing to the other. It's not that you suddenly stop one day being an editor and become something else, but over a period of time, that's what, what I've done. Uh, and I guess, you know, up until I got to breakfast, I was doing sort of more and more managerial roles alongside editorial roles. And the thing about the BBC is that whatever level you're at, um, you're still if you're in BBC News, you're still involved in editorial. You know, it's still about the news and about the programmes and about the content we make. Um, even though the mass, vast majority of your day-to-day -day work might be in other areas, it's the news that is kind of the reason you're there and you should never forget that. I think for, for us, a big challenge is being is being relevant to many, many people in different places. So we're, uh, our, our services go into more than 200 different countries and territories. And uh, in, a, in a digital world, people increasingly demand relevance. They want to think that news is made for them. Uh, and to some degree, you can do that so that we have, you know, we localise content in, in some markets in Australia, in Singapore, in, uh, in parts of Africa, in, in the US. So it becomes more relevant. It's basically the same global agenda. But for a global news television channel, it's much harder to do that. You're basically trying to produce a set of stories that you think will appeal to audiences, the audiences that are coming to you in many different countries across many different time zones. And that's a really difficult challenge, actually. It's sort of imperfect in a way because you know, you're broadcasting to um, a US breakfast audience at the same time as an Asian evening audience. And how do you make the same content work for both of those audiences? So that's the sort of that's a really big um, challenge for us. Um, money is a big challenge because um, there isn't enough. There's never enough, and global news reporting is extremely expensive. And we have a massive advantage of through the license fee. The BBC has guaranteed income, which enables it to sustain this massive network of international correspondents. And we uh, are able to access those correspondents as well as those that we pay for directly ourselves. But there's never, you know, you always feel like you need you need more than you've got. So, and it must be the same for every news organisation. You know, there's never quite enough to do to do what you want to do. Um, but, you know, I could go on. There's millions of challenges, but that's just two to to start with. I can look at lots of of highlights, both from I suppose you know you think about when you when you answer a question like that, you think about my immediate response is sort of what are the biggest stories. Um, and so that's one way of answering the question about what's the highlight. And, and um, it's rather in the nature of journalism that some of the most terrible things that happen are the biggest stories that you cover. So I was the editor of Breakfast, uh, Breakfast TV, when 9-11 happened. And in terms of any single story and the impact upon me as a, as a journalist, uh, that's the one that has been the most memorable, the biggest thing I've ever been involved in, in covering. And I didn't, I didn't go to New York 
to cover it. I covered it from London, running running a newsroom in London. And in fact, we didn't even get to report it until the next morning because it happened at lunchtime in in UK time. Um, but in terms of just the kind of sheer um, kind of shock and horror at seeing it happen, you know, seeing it happen in front of you, which is now the nature of these global news stories, and then the 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 consequences of that. That for me is the sort of the biggest the biggest moment I think. Um, I mean, in terms of you know, to, to to answer the, in terms of highlights, you know, I think that um, uh, I, I think w- actually we moved all of our output from different parts of London to this amazing new broadcast centre um, about three years ago now. Actually, it took a while to, to, but but for me, one of the one of the highlights was was when we had um, the sort of completion of the move for us was when we moved the TV output here. So when BBC World News went live on air from this building for the first time, that was a great sense of um, achievement and pride because uh, it wasn't just about sort of moving the furniture and moving the people. We completely relaunched the channel at that time and I I thought it just delivered all the things we wanted it to. So that was an amazing thing. Uh, Well, good question. And it's something that's changed over time, actually, because as... I mean, you, you know this, media has become much more immediate. Uh, the stories travel much faster, pictures travel much faster. Um, in some ways, that's made our job easier as well, although it's also made it harder. And it's made it easier in the sense that um, uh, in the world of, of Twitter and other social media, there are a lot more sources out there now. So you know pretty quickly that something big is happening. The one, the one story that um, people always quote when, they, you know, when everybody realised this was possible was the, the plane that crash landed in the Hudson River in New York, um, which uh, that was, I think, the first sort of big Twitter story that very, very quickly somebody posted a picture on Twitter of this plane floating in the Hudson River. Um, uh, and if, before that, you know, it would have been the first crew to get to the scene and then going back to the office and finding the pictures before anybody knew it was really happening and what it was. And all of a sudden, you know, there it was in everybody's timeline. And so uh, that, that's changed things. You know, information does come in much faster. But the, but the downside of that is that people expect you to know everything much faster. And of course, you don't know everything. Um, uh, all you know is what you can find out. And what you can find out isn't necessarily just because it's on Twitter doesn't mean it's true. Uh, you know, you still have to, 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 to carry out checks and... Um, try and establish whether things really are true before you say them. And uh, I think the really important thing that we have learned is to be um, as open and transparent with the audience as you possibly can be. So that when you say something, you say where the information's come from and you say what you don't know as well. So, you know, we're getting reports. It's a sort of very overused phrase, but actually it's a sort of good summary of the starting point. And... Uh, you know, there are witnesses reported as saying so and so, you know, if, if you are, or, or even the Reuters news agency is reporting this, whatever it is, but just be clear about where the information is coming from and be clear that if you haven't confirmed it yourselves, then say so. You know, the BBC hasn't been able to establish this, but there's a report on this agency. And there are some also some just common sense rules that people here are pretty good at applying, which is that um, if something sort of feels and looks wrong, then there's a pretty good chance that it is wrong. So don't just say everything that comes in front of you. And there have been many occasions where, you know, inaccurate reports of things have come in and others have gone with them and we haven't because it just kind of, well, you know, we don't, that just doesn't feel right. Um, and, you know, it's it's better to be wrong and second, uh, it's better to be right and second, you know. Because uh, not about, I, I, th- I think it is perfectly possible to be very fast and be accurate um, but it is not about being first at all costs. Nobody here thinks that. Uh, and you, you know, in your career, as you develop, you should never think that. You know, you want to. That, that you can be fast, uh, but you can also be right.